Welcome one and all to the Seven Ages Audio Journal. It's time once again to pour up a glass and pull up a chair as we gather together here in our favorite corner of the Cross Time Pub, making our way through studies of the past and breaking down the discovery process like a comet blasting into our atmosphere. Joining me, as always, are my colleagues extraordinaire Jason Pintrail and James Waldo. Jason, how you doing? Oh, doing great, man. I've uh, been dodging the flu and have landed safely back here in the Cross Time Pub. Better that than objects of extraterrestrial origin, right? You never want to have to be dodging asteroids or meteoroids or anything else that might, you know, space junk, stuff that we put up there is probably even more concerning these days. Yeah, well, it's a good thing we have a space fence now, huh? Yeah, exactly. Our space force putting those boys to work, huh? Hey, James, is that going to be your next line of work? Are you going to be applying soon for the space force? Well, if there's a space fence, I might get a job painting it. So I'm just... <laughs> You know what? I, I talked to you guys earlier about, you know, what we were talking about my exciting week. I'm just glad to be here. You did have an exciting week, didn't you? And I, did. I guess you've got terrestrial uh, issues on your mind with regard to your vehicular concerns, right? Yeah. Rather yeah. than the Space Force and winged things. <laughs> yeah, I'm just glad to be here. Let's just say that. <laughs> there you go. That's right. Burning up the roads. Hey, I, I've been yeah. right there. When you mentioned that, I didn't tell you my story, but uh, many years ago, as I was traveling on my way to a performance with my bluegrass gig, I hit one of those very wonderful little potholes on US 25 South coming out of North Carolina, headed down into South Carolina, had a blowout, and it uh, it actually bent the, the rim of the wheel as well, and I had to get the entire thing replaced. Always fun stuff, huh? Yeah, yeah, that sounds very similar, actually. It, there's even more adventure to that story, but I'm going to save that for when we pony up at the bar here a little later. So anyway, yeah, lots of news, I guess, since the last time that we all gathered together here. Did you guys see this one from NPR.org with a very compelling headline, Ghost DNA in West Africans Complicates the Story of Human Origins? I don't know if either of you guys saw this. If you did, if you've read it, you probably know why I'm so intrigued by this. And it's something of an update to some stories that we've touched on already in the past and really ongoing discoveries in the field of anthropology as it relates to DNA. And fundamentally what they report are the fact that in modern West Africans, researchers have found evidence in the genetic material from hundreds of people from Nigeria and Sierra Leone that indicate signals of what they call ghost DNA. And what that means specifically is that there's an unknown ancestor that appears to be present in the genetic material of modern human groups in that part of the world. And so what this, of course, means is that although we don't have, and they actually state in the NPR article here, we don't have archaeological evidence, we don't have any kind of fossil record remains, but there is absolutely unequivocal evidence for an early human ancestor that we haven't identified yet. And if you think about this, there have been similar studies in the last few years in parts of Eurasia with existing human populations in parts of the world today uh, indicating the presence of Neanderthals, Denisovans. But then there are at least a couple of others that we can identify. Yet again, this concept of ghost DNA. And what it's causing anthropologists to have to kind of think of is, well, okay, first of all, just because we don't have the fossils on hand doesn't mean that they don't exist. We now have clear evidence of this, but we haven't found those fossils yet. So we either have to get out there and we have to find those in the field or maybe in samples already on hand in different universities or in different museums or research facilities. That's always interesting. I remember the Red Deer Cave uh, 
group, which I say group rather than uh, using other terms because there's some dispute about whether or not they were modern Homo sapiens sapiens or some other group. Apparently, mitochondrial DNA hasn't been extracted from those remains, but they definitely look strange enough that some anthropologists think this could be a separate group entirely. What we do know, though, is that they were from around 12,000 years ago, and it suggests that there indeed could be some groups that we haven't fully identified yet, but which were interbreeding with early humans and which may have actually existed relatively a fairly short time ago. Really exciting time for anthropology right now, guys. Yeah. So I I think that um, as, you know, more research is done and and really, you know, the thing that has probably helped us out mostly is, is our technology. So as technology improves and these, you know, we learn these new skills to uh, ways to look back in time. uh, I think that the, this, uh, this mystery, instead of becoming clear, will probably get more complicated before it gets, before it gets completely figured out. Well, there's something to that. Because in the article here from NPR, they actually so much as say that. They say that these findings are essentially, and I want to quote one of the researchers here. Uh, he says, it's almost certainly the case that the story is incredibly complex and complicated, and we have kind of these initial hints about the complexity. And he seems to be indicating that, yeah, the more we learn, the less we thought we knew and the more questions that arise. But really, that's in truth the scientific process. And so as we reveal more of the unknown, sure, there are going to be some new mysteries. And with time, I think we'll find them. But again, my guess is that some of these disputed early archaic human varieties, Red Deer Cave, uh, the Ping Hu One jaw fragment, uh, and others, perhaps we're going to begin to identify these probably as being some of these archaic human groups. And this picture will become somewhat clearer. But then again, there are also those questions that tend to arise from time to time. That, to me, just makes it exciting more than anything. Well, yeah, and every time we think we are getting somewhere that we're that much closer to answering one of those questions, just like we're we're saying here, it it only gets more complicated. We see the same thing with the peopling of America. Everything seems so clear-cut with the original theories, but every year, as we learn, find more sites, find more discoveries, uh, the picture only gets that much more complicated, and eventually we hope to figure it all out and have that, you know, 30,000 foot view of exactly what went, what went on during the, the peopling of America. But as of now, we're at that point to where for every time we step forward with an answer, we get that many more questions. So it's, that's again, the scientific process. Yeah, it is. Now you mentioned the peopling of the Americas. And again, one of the, one of those long held contentious debates has been exactly how did ancient humans move around? Did they have to require on land paths or did early Homo sapiens sapiens, and maybe also some of those even earlier cousins, did they possess the ability to travel by sea? And I don't know if you guys saw this recent paper that was published uh, in the journal Antiquity by Cambridge University Press, but anthropologist Yusuke Kaifu of the Japanese National Museum of Nature and Science believes that he has found a plausible scenario through which ancient watercraft could be used to traverse the oceans. And I want to share a little from the abstract of that article. The earliest colonization of oceanic islands, he writes, by Homo sapiens occurred around 50,000 to 30,000 years ago in the Western Pacific. Yet how this was achieved remains a matter of debate. And so he notes that with a focus on East Asia, the research presented in the paper tests the hypothesis that bamboo rafts were used for these early maritime migrations. And according to his research, the authors review the evidence for Paleolithic seafaring in East Asia as the context for an experimental archaeology project to build two bamboo watercraft. Shades of Thor Heyerdahl here. Because it is indeed very similar to what he did many decades ago. But Haaretz, also reporting on this study, noted, and I want to quote from that article, Some have long suspected that early humans and maybe even proto-modern humans too could sail, Anybody can cling to a palm tree swept out to sea and with luck reach an island. Which is funny that they point that out because, again, one of the theories about how certain uh, different primate groups made their way around the ancient world, maybe going all the way back to like the Miocene, had been the natural raft theory. Monkeys on logs being carried great distances, sometimes stopping here and there along little island chains where they could conceivably collect some food and water and over long periods of time being carried around the world like that. Now, again, that remains unproven, but I've always said if biologists think 
and have entertained the serious possibility that monkeys could do it, surely humans could take a stab at that too. Coming back to Haaretz for a minute, now a team of scientists, as we mentioned in the abstract which we read from, has demonstrated by proving a negative that while early modern humans may have wandered the seas floating on rickety rafts, they had to have mastered the art of proper boating which is significant, and so this team proved that negative by showing that it was not possible to reach the current whipped Ryukyu Island chain in Japan using reed rafts, yet early modern humans did in fact reach the Ryukyu chain sometime between 30,000 to 40,000 years ago. And hence again, coming back to the abstract, sea trials demonstrate the unsuitability of bamboo, at least in East Asia, indicating that more sophisticated and durable vessels would have been required to traverse the regions of the ocean in question. Mm. In other words, a simple raft wouldn't have done it, according to this study, but the people somehow got there, which implies that there were more sophisticated sailing vessels involved. But what's the problem? Why can't we find them? Think about that. Well, because they don't last. They are perishable. But this goes back, and I've told you guys this before, my theory about uh, humans is that, you know, if you give a given a, uh, a you know, a large enough uh, human population and everything else being equal, we'll tend to solve the same types of engineering problems and come across the same types of discoveries on similar timelines, no matter where the population is. So if you've got a population that lives near the sea at some point along the same types of, uh, you know, uh, timeline, like I said before, they're going to figure out how to travel along the water. So this doesn't really surprise me at all. This could go back as long as there's humans, you know, we figure these things out. I mean, how long does it take to see you, you know, for a couple of people to see, you know, a, a log jam float down a river or see something float in the ocean and go, Hey, you know what? Maybe we could, maybe we could just make that somehow. Right. You know, we can just make the environment, you know, suit our needs, which is exactly what we still do today. Right. Yeah. I always loved how, you know, the ancient martial arts styles, especially the, the Chinese varieties of Gung Fu and the like, you know, they often are, based around or named after islands, you know, the the style of the tiger, the style of the crane, right? Mm. Praying mantis style. But again, the idea there is, hey, we're borrowing from things we see in nature, and we are, you know, kind of appropriating these for uh, uses that humans can, can manage. Again, it's kind of a bizarre one. But, you know, as a kid, I always liked the way that I, I used to envision martial arts masters going out, sitting in nature, meditating and watching the natural world and thinking, hey, how can I how can I borrow from this? How can I borrow from that? But in a more mechanical sense of things, I'm sure that that, like you're saying, James, probably did lead to a lot of innovations in the ancient world. And again, if uh, Yusuke Kaifu's study here is any indication, it seems like there was probably a level of sophistication that many wouldn't have thought of. But again, there's that old saying, absence of evidence is not necessarily evidence of absence. Just because we can't find those watercraft doesn't mean that they didn't exist. And I think this was really interesting the way that they did this study and were able to, again, find a strong notion of a strong support rather for the idea that, yeah, these people had to have gotten there somehow. We know that this alone couldn't have done it. They had to have had a certain level of mechanical knowledge to achieve it. We have to assume something like this was being utilized. Correct. Yeah. I mean, you just have, I think you have to just, uh, you know, go with what you sort of know about humans. Uh, and just assume that they probably did some kind of seafaring if they lived near the sea at some point, even though we don't have evidence for it. Absolutely. Well, again, fascinating discoveries, teaching us new things, things that many would never have guessed about the ancient world. Of course, it's always a surprise to us, too, when we hear from you guys out there. No emails this week, but we did have a couple of donations roll in, one from Dale Wilkerson at $50, and then also Robert Benz at the $20 level. Thank you, guys. For your ongoing support of our endeavors here at Seven Ages, you know, we have one of our yearly field trips coming up here, uh, which is the White Pond Excavation. Every time uh, that time of year rolls around, I start getting excited because, of course, we learn so much about the archaeological process while we're there. And we've made so many uh, dear friends and we've met so many incredible colleagues, made so many connections uh, over the years working there. But tonight is a very special conversation in that regard for us because we are going to be talking with the geoarchaeologist who has overseen that dig for a number of years now, Dr. Chris Moore. 
And of course, he is no stranger to the Seven Ages audience. In fact, I think as far as Seven Ages alumni goes, he is uh, the most visited guest on this program, having appeared probably a good four times, maybe five uh, at least four. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. We had him on with Dr. Al Goodyear, then a couple of interviews from White Pond. Uh, and then, of course, this conversation that we'll have tonight. But Chris was kind enough to bring along a friend, somebody we really respect and admire and somebody we have wanted to talk to for a long time. And that is Dr. Malcolm LeConte. And as a planetary scientist and a guy who has probably done all more work than most in relation to trying to understand this enigma that is the Younger Dryas and the ever popular and at times controversial impact theory in relation to that, Malcolm LeCompte is kind of legendary in his own right. And so it's going to be quite a conversation to sit down and talk with both of these guys at once about this ever-enduring mystery of the Younger Dryas and, again, the contention that an impact might have actually played some role in that. Now, Jason, help us out here. We've got a little background to give because this isn't the first time we've talked about this. And for those who may be new to this program, we'd like to direct their attention over to some additional data that we have to offer. Yeah, absolutely. The subject of the Younger Dryas impact is not something that you can simply put into one podcast and cover. This is an ever-evolving topic. There's new uh, research going on constantly. Each year brings new discoveries and and a uh, momentum of the, the actual research moving forward. So this is picking up on the newest and latest information concerning the Younger Dryas hypothesis and some of the newer information that's came out in the last couple of years. So listeners may remember back to episode nine of the Seven Ages Audio Journal podcast, where we had our friend and fellow research associate, George Howard of the Cosmic Tusk, uh, as our guest. And he did an excellent job of laying the foundation of uh, the research from where it was to where it is now. And I'll also keep in mind that the CosmicTusk.com is a repository for all things Younger Dryas Impact. So all the papers and many of the articles along with his personal blogs can be found at his website, thecosmictusk.com. And uh, we're going to pick the conversation up here tonight with the newest research with uh, Dr. Christopher Moore and Dr. Malcolm LeCompte, uh, both of which are longstanding friends, as we mentioned. But I will say this, uh, with Dr. LeCompte, he's someone that we've gotten to know uh, fairly well here in the last few months. Um, great guy. We, we really clicked and got along. We found many subjects in the scientific community that we are all interested in, and therefore we've been able to build a friendship. And so I think uh, the dynamic of having him on with Chris Moore is going to set up for an excellent interview. This is certainly a special occasion tonight for the Seven Ages Audio Journal. We have some alumni in our presence and also a new voice, but one that will be familiar to many out there in our listening audience. And so we'll get some introductions out of the way and then dive right in. Christopher R. Moore, Ph.D., is a geoarchaeologist and Special Projects Director with the Savannah River Archaeological Research Program. His research interests include site formation processes and geochronology of stratified sites in the southeastern coastal plain, paleo-environmental reconstruction, early hunter-gatherer adaptations, lithic technology, and immunological blood residue analysis of stone tools. But wait, there's more. Chris is also the lead researcher of the White Pond Human Paleoecology Project and has authored and co-authored numerous papers on the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis, including one documenting the presence of widespread platinum anomalies at the Younger Dryas Boundary, as well as a recent paper on the White Pond site in South Carolina, which we have visited many times. And it's wonderful, as always, to have you back. Dr. Moore, how are you? 
Doing good. Doing good. Thank you. Yeah, it is really great to have you here. Truly alumni. I think actually he holds the record now, gents, for appearances here (laughs) on the podcast. Yeah. And thanks to you, you've helped us make this wonderful connection with another uh, research affiliate uh, that uh, broadening our network, getting to know people who are really at the heart of this. I think that a name that many, uh, if you studied the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis, you'll be familiar with this name, and hence the gentleman who also joins us tonight. Now, Malcolm LeCompte is a planetary scientist and remote sensing specialist who holds a BS with honors in physics from the University of Wyoming and an MS in astrogeophysics from the University of Colorado in Boulder. He received his Ph.D. in astrophysical planetary and atmospheric sciences in 1984. LeCompte also became affiliated with the Naval Aviation Reserve in 1980 and before ending his military flight career in 1991, a man of many trades, he compiled over 1,000 hours of military air crew and private pilot time, off, officially retiring from the Naval Reserve as a commander in 1998 after 23 years of active service. Now, from 2004 until 2009, after a postdoc appointment at the Harvard College Observatory and the Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, as well as, I'll note, a period managing DOD-sponsored research and development projects, LeCompte held a faculty position as an associate professor and research director at Elizabeth City State University's Center of Excellence in Remote Sensing Education and Research. And now that he's retired, Malcolm has since devoted himself to investigating Earth impacts during the late Pleistocene and Holocene epochs by asteroids and comets. And he is currently working in collaboration with colleagues like Dear Dr. Moore at ECSU and other research organizations. And so allow me to give a very hearty welcome to you, Dr. Malcolm LeCompte. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much, and it's very good to be here. Yeah, it's really good to have you here. And having spoken with both you guys off the mic a little, uh, you know, it's it's quite obvious that in addition to sharing a lot of the same interests in relation to our research efforts, uh, you know, I think we all have a lot in common otherwise, uh, you know, from music to just our general interests. And so it's just great to be able to have right. a lot of like minds together like this, uh, you know, for one conversation. I'm sure it's going to be epic. Uh, Chris... Maybe we'll kind of lead off with you because, as our listeners know, we've spent a fair amount of time with you and hope to do a little more of that this year, too, uh, down at the White Pond site. And that was a big topic in the news this year because of a yeah. paper we had, we had been long awaiting ourselves, the official publication of a paper about the White Pond site. Right, right. We finally got the paper published this year in uh, Nature Scientific Reports, or actually late last year. Uh, and uh, after four and a half years of research with many, many different colleagues from different institutions and, and in fact, all over the world, uh, people were involved uh, with looking at some of the samples from the cores that we collected. Uh, so, yeah, we, we really got, you know, some good response from that work. Uh, all of this is on, uh, in this case, not the archaeology, but the, the Viber core that we collected from White Pond. So we have a incredible, you know, 15,000 year record uh and the sediments, uh, white pond that we're able to look at uh, for the paper that we published. So, so we're real happy to finally get that paper out. Yeah, we're really happy to see it. And of course, as a geoarchaeologist, one of the things you've been looking at uh, with relation to the white pond site is whether or not there would be data from that site that would be uh, in the furtherance of our understanding of this possible impact that occurred uh, toward the end of the Pleistocene. And you have found some evidence in support of that. Can we talk about what you found and what the paper describes in relation to that? Right. I think, well, you know, one of the main things is, you know, after the initial um, widespread platinum anomaly paper that we published several years ago, um, and then seeing some of the earlier records from the ice core data, you know, we don't have ice core records in South Carolina or in the Southeast, but so we needed, we really needed something that would give us a higher resolution record with maybe some less disturbance and, and a little more depth than we typically see in archaeological sites. So White Pond became with, you know, from Al Goodyear and, and Mark Brooks and others, I knew that, I, that from earlier work done in 1980 by Watts that White Pond was potentially an incredible archive of, of data and sediments that could really inform us about, you know, what was going on during the Younger Dryas. Mm-hmm. And so one of the major things we wanted to look at right away was, do we have the platinum anomaly in the White Pond core that's similar to what we found elsewhere? Right. And it was located there, which is extremely exciting. But, of course, it has been found elsewhere in recent right. months and, in fact, uh, something that we've discussed. And, you know, Malcolm, maybe we can come over to you for a bit of commentary on this. And also, more broadly, 
the work you've done in relation to the to the Younger Dryas research, because there was a paper that was published uh, well almost said earlier this year, all new year, so last year we saw a publication about the discovery of the platinum anomaly in South Africa as well. Uh, broadly speaking, what does this mean, apart from the fact that, rather obviously, this was a global event that occurred? Well, in a lot of ways, there's a there's a narrative to this whole thing that, that seems, in some respects, to be similar to, but even bigger than, uh, a story that's been hanging around in impact science for a long time, and that's the uh, the Australasian impact strewn field. Mm-hmm. Uh, nobody could find a crater. They just found these this vast area, ten percent of the Earth's surface. People were finding these these uh, microtectites across the uh, the Southeast Asia and uh, into Australia, and uh, in a lot, I guess, in a lot of Pacific cores, but uh, especially in the area of around Vietnam, Thailand. Uh, Cambodia. And uh, I guess just recently, there was an indication that a crater had been found or what the signs of, of a potential crater had been revealed. And that was now emerging from the shadows. But it was accepted for a long, long time that it, that there was an impact even without a crater. Uh, we've sort of had the same run, except that, that the Younger Dryas has been resisted. I, I think more, I think it's accurate to say more uh, uh, vocally than than the Australasian uh, strewn field, yet our our strewn field appears to be uh, even larger. I think the problem with ours is that the, the microtectites tend to be fairly small, and uh, in fact they're micro microtectites, if you will. Oh wow! Uh, they're really it's a small small. Uh, maybe it's just because they haven't checked the soil to, with the same diligence, having found the microtectites from the Australasian impact more readily. The larger stuff may be more readily found, and they just haven't looked for the small stuff. But we find the small stuff, the platinum anomaly, the uh, the micro the, the microspherals, magnetic microspherals, some glass spherules, some melt glass. We find it in a very inhomogeneous uh, distribution, which may be an artifact of, of the initial uh, – Impact it may have sprayed in, in rays that tend to make the uh, the field the strewn field very inhomogeneous, or it could be that there was more of a shower like effect uh, where you've got multiple bodies coming in, and uh, it's just not clear at all yet what what it is that we're we're you know we're really seeing with this uh, this impact. Yeah, does that give you an idea? Well, absolutely. That right. Has extended it quite a ways, and I'd expect to see. Uh, uh, Proxies coming out of the uh, Atlantic Ocean cores between the South Atlantic uh, and uh, North Atlantic. And there are reports that that they've come out of the Pacific cores and Atlantic cores, I believe. Uh, But uh, there's a lot of that research has yet to be done. Yeah. Yeah. The the South African evidence, right, with the platinum, I mean, that was – we already was sort of leaning that way. But certainly that's leaning – that's really showing more the the global scale of – uh, maybe not the event, but certainly of the distribution of these proxies. Absolutely, which makes it so exciting that that information has been recovered from a site that you, Chris, have been working for several seasons there at White Pond. Uh, right. We, we we see, well, there's that old expression that comes to mind, think globally, act locally, right? I guess you've been really doing that and putting that into effect at White Pond. Right, and yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, like I said, we don't have ice records here. Uh, all of my previous work has been on shallow coastal plain archaeological sites in North Carolina, South Carolina, and, of course, more recently in Florida. Uh, but all of these sites are shallow. They've got post-depositional uh, disturbances. You know, there's there's all kinds of uh, factors that make it looking for the proxies, whether it's platinum or microspirals. There's issues in terms of, you know, preservation of these various layers, you know, in the right you know, in the younger dry layer, there's, um, and so look, looking at a core from White Pond, you know, we had over two and a half meters uh, of peat and mud that was laid at the down in the bottom of this of this pond uh, in South Carolina. You know, for the last thirteen to fifteen thousand years. In fact, it goes it, it extends six meters uh, from uh, earlier work that was done uh, that dates back at least thirty thousand years. So we've got a thirty thousand year record. Um, at White Pond, that's it's, you know for us, 
it's in South Carolina, that's about as close as we can get to find to something comparable to a, a ice core or even like a Marine Corps record. Um, and that will allow us to really look closely and see, you know, to date the core precisely, which we did with the White Pond core. We used over 22 AMS dates uh, within a one meter section of core. So it's extremely well dated, which is the thing we had to do right right off the bat was we, we had to identify, you know, did we have the younger driest boundary layer? Was it there? Was it preserved? Could we identify it? And then once we did that with the red and carbon dating, then go in and sample the core and test for all of the different things we looked at. You know, we got the large platinum anomaly uh, within this. It's really a, a, probably about a 10 centimeter section of core uh, that dates to the younger dryas onset period. Um, and so within that, we found all of these proxies, including elevated soot, uh, uh, Sid Mitra at ECU and other colleagues, you know, found the you know, high concentration of, of soot indicating regional burning and wildfires that's, you know, consistent with uh, Wendy Walbach at all papers and uh, global biomass kinds of issues. Uh, we looked at, you know, we obviously have the platinum. We have platinum, large amounts of platinum um, coming in. Um, at, right after the beginning of the, right after the onset period, we have, we looked at sporomyella, which is an indicator of, uh, it's a fungal uh, indicator of mega herbivores. And so that sort of gets to the whole idea of environmental consequences. And so we were really interested in, in tying this together as much as we could. And not only seeing that do we think this event is indicated in the core, but exactly when it happened and what were the environmental consequences. We're still looking at some of the, the evidence in terms of the pollen. But that, that's, we still want to do more of that. But uh, in terms of the local environment, the, the forest composition, you know, what kinds of changes might have happened. But the spore data... There's certainly there's a decline in the spore miella at, right at the beginning of the white onset that's certainly consistent with the idea that there might have been some effect on the local, you know, mega herbivores. Uh, we don't think that they went extinct instantaneously at, mm -hmm. at the white onset. Clearly they didn't, but there's certainly evidence at White Pond to, to back up the idea that there was a, a, perhaps a, an immediate effect as a result of the impact and uh, environmental consequences. Yeah. Hey, Chris, I think we talked about this before, but uh, when the paper came out last year, I was looking at, and I looked at the, at, at uh, some of the data for the sediment column and uh, for, uh, you know, the, like you talked about a few minutes ago about how, how deep the, the sediment is there. And one of the things I picked up on was in the, in the YD layer, <clears throat> which is about 10 centimeters, it seemed right. the way I interpreted it anyway was the, that the sedimentation rate for that layer was much higher for the rest of the column after that. And I took that to be representative of the entire uh, white pond area, maybe, you know, not just the edges. So to me, that seemed like it was more of a uh, not runoff into the runoff into white pond, but it was it was uh, the amount of particulate probably that was in the air that was settling down on the water and and. But I don't, I don't know how you felt about that or, or. Yeah, I mean, the one the one issue that we talk about in the paper is we have the 10 centimeters of younger dry onset material. And we have the proxies in there that we expect that we hope to see, the platinum in particular, in the large soot spike. But immediately above that 10 centimeters, and we don't even know exactly, we haven't really defined it in 100%, but there's a, we have an unconformity or we have a, a you know, something, you know, it goes directly from. Uh, younger dry onset, apparently, to early Holocene. You have roughly 2,500 year gap potentially that's just missing. It's just there's just the word either there was no sedimentation, there's been removal or sediment in the core, um, or you know there was just a period of uh, you know where we just we didn't there's very or very slow sedimentation. That's the yeah. other option. As a as a geologist, when we see that in the rock layers, to me that means that the, the area was there was no water there it was exposed and maybe some of it was removed by wind action or whatever and yeah. that's what i think of when i think unconformity right right well yeah that's a possibility and, and one of the things that we i was able to briefly mention in the paper is that in that 10 centimeter section there are the muddy sediments have a sort of a sort of describe it as sort of a, a toothpaste sort of extruded compressed you know area just underneath as if as if things are walking around in, in either very shallow water conditions or perhaps even almost maybe possibly even drought conditions. 
Uh, we've got so we've got pr probably a very shallow pool of water that's in white pond during the younger dryas onset, perhaps in response to drought conditions. Um, we have got at the very top of the YD section. We've got um, we and I briefly mentioned this as well in the paper. We've got a very section, very small area of that little YD section of, that appears to be oxidized, you know, as if it's been you know exposed to, to the air. Um, so again, all of that kind of, as you say, backs up the idea that there was a, perhaps a period of where the, there was very little water, uh, in, in white pond at some time during the white, younger dry onset or thereafter and where we didn't get a lot of, of sedimentation going on as a result. That's interesting. Yeah. It's very interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the white pond, not only is it, is it such a, a significant place for the testing and the anomalies and the proxies, but there's also the archaeological side of it. So as the dig seasons continue, the excavations continue, um, we're still seeking out those, those artifacts that are going to be um, telltale signs. So, Chris, give us a little bit of the background of the archaeology so far. What are you finding at the site, and how are we interpreting that information? Yeah, we've got about, this will be our third year, I think, in the main area that we're working on, uh, White Pond archaeologically. And we've, we've gotten early archaic artifacts that go back, you know, 10, 11,000 years. We, we did find a Dalton uh, point that goes back as much as 12,000 years. Uh, in the area that we are finding these, these are, you know, approximately about a meter deep. Uh, and mm -hmm. so we've got, you know, we know we've got, occupations around White Pond after the Younger Dryas or during the with the Dalton occupation perhaps during the middle to later parts of the Younger Dryas uh, at a meter that's buried along the slope there in the sand about a meter deep. Uh, this past season as we were moving over in the excavation block we were finding that the archaeology is actually diving down quite deep and we actually mm -hmm. wound up we didn't find any other uh, Dalton artifacts but we did find more earlier archaic artifacts uh, from 10, 11,000 years uh, that are probably in as deep a context that I've ever worked on in the coastal plain. We've got we've got early archaic, clear, buried strata essentially of early archaic artifacts, a, a meter a meter 45 uh, below the surface, which for the coastal plain is quite deep. Right. Um, yeah. And in, and in the case of White Pond, where we're where we're digging, it appears to be principally one of, of slope wash. We're at the base of the slope, and so we've got these massive Pleistocene ice age sand dunes up behind us that are providing a source of sand that's probably over the millennia has been washing down the slope and and burying these early archaic and late Paleo Indian artifacts um, to a depth that I've really haven't seen before in the coastal plain. Um, right. As you're listening to this, uh, you have to keep in mind that the site and the excavation that we're describing, uh, just as, as Dr. Moore said, it, it is on a slope. So there's there's a lot of factors there. There's a lot of dynamic factors there that can affect uh, the depth and the deposition of the artifacts. Uh, the Dalton so far is by far the oldest. Where was the Dalton in relation to depth? Where, was it found in a place that it should be according to the stratigraphy or was it seemed to be out of place? No, it seemed about right from the area that we were there. We found the Dalton Point. Uh, we we were getting other early archaic artifacts at just about the same depth, and so the Dalton was only slightly deeper than where we were getting some of the other early archaic artifacts. And so that's that's typical for what we see in the coastal plain. Again, a, a roughly about a meter deep. Uh, we were getting uh, you know notch you know corner notch points, um, some side notch points. And the Dalton was immediately below that. It's one of the interesting things, again, getting back to this idea of, a, you know, we have this this missing time in the core. We also see over and over again, we get, we well, we do have Paleo-Indian artifacts. Uh, we don't have that yet at White Pond, but we we're, where we do have Clovis artifacts quite often in the coastal plain, they're, they're almost identical depth to early archaic artifacts. So there's, they appear to be either conflated together or with very little separation indicating very little sedimentation in between those time periods. It's very interesting. Yeah, one of the many clues that brings all of this together. And again, uh, speaking from the perspective, I guess, of especially the Seven Ages team, you know, I think we really kind of 
uh, got into this primarily with an interest in the Younger Dryas. Uh, going back many years before I took interest in archaeology, I'd read, um, in fact, that was my first introduction to uh, Mammoth Trumpet. It had actually been Firestone right. and Topping's paper, right? and Or their article, rather, that was featured. And I remember reading about that. At that time, they were proposing something along the lines of a supernova, but um, when Jason and I met, he quite obviously had a, a background in avocational archaeology and also paleontology, which we don't mention enough on this show. This guy knows shark teeth like it's nobody's business. But first time we met, in fact, he actually brought me a beautiful uh, fossil shark tooth. Uh, so that really cemented the, the friendship. But uh, there was a phone call that occurred after that where he says, let's talk about uh, that period, you know, this this ar- this this paleo-Indian period. You know what happened then, right? And I was like, yeah, it's funny. I'm not into the archaeology like you are, but I'm aware of big changes that were occurring at that time. We were so excited when we saw the Platinum Anomaly paper because this was, as far as proxy evidence, really one of those defining moments where we, there had already been articles in, in major U.S. Uh, um, uh, newspapers and the like, you know, that were uh, calling for a requiem for the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis. I mean, it was like dead on arrival for a lot of these folks to see yeah, that there right. were... To see that there were additional article, or rather that there were papers being published by you and Malcolm and others that were continuing to find evidence, and yet there was a sort of resistance by the scientific mainstream was quite interesting for me uh, because it began to make me think, you know, not only is this something I've been interested in since I was about a teenager, but yeah. this is a very, very much a scientific area that is developing. I mean, this is there are developments underway, and right now, I think in the last couple of years, we've seen more in support of the impact hypothesis than at any time before. Uh, oh, right, absolutely. So, I mean, well, Chris, and then Malcolm, I want to get your perspectives on that too, with White Pond and its significance in relation to this ongoing research study uh, that the Comet Research Group and others have undertaken. This has got to be a very interesting time to be participating in these kinds of studies. Well, I think it illuminates a, a, a problem. The, the whole saga of this this research kind of reveals a, a tendency in science to fossilize, mm-hmm. to become uh, orthodox ridden, and uh, and thank thankfully there are really good scientists out there. And I would I'm speaking specifically of of Wally Broker at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, who initially came in as a skeptic and set out to prove to disprove the whole notion of an impact at the Younger Dryas boundary, and in the end became one of our biggest supporters by uh, supporting research that uh, looked for the evidence. In fact, the plat the original platinum anomaly was found in the Greenland, Greenland ice sheet core, and uh, that turned his his uh, understanding of, of what had happened around and it started us on that that path to uh, to search for ourselves and that really was uh, a turning point for sure yeah Malcolm by the way if we can just interject here for anyone at home who's not familiar with Wally broker uh, many have called him kind of the father of modern science in relation to climate change and again someone who initially skeptical came around to looking at the abundance of evidence in support of this Younger Dryas impact hypothesis as being clearly evident of some big change that occurred around that time. Can we talk about Wally just a bit? Uh, a little. I don't know nearly enough about his life to be a biographer, but uh, <laughs> sure. I admire the man uh, tremendously for his uh, integrity. I mean, he's exactly the kind of scientist you hope you be, you can be, is, uh, you know, approach with skepticism, but also uh, make sure you understand the evidence and, and examine it. Honestly, mm-hmm. right. and actually, he passed away. I think was it uh, last year? Unfortunately, isn't that right? That's correct. Yeah, we we'll miss him right. <laughs> pretty yeah. much. Yeah. yeah, he was he was very influential. Well, it, again, you know, just briefly, so that folks kind of know who he is and what his relationship was to all of this. Uh, you know, he was a fascinating individual. And of course, George Howard had mentioned him uh, and some of his ongoing involvement at his uh, Cosmic Tusk uh, website. Now. I also want to mention here in relation to the broader conversation that we're having, as we've continued to see the evolution of ideas and and mounting evidence in support of this driest impact. I mean, again, Malcolm, I'd, I'd kind of like to get your perspectives in terms of not just the platinum anomaly, but all of the different proxy data that is kind of building the support network in relation to this and and making this a pivotal area of study right now for archaeologists, uh, for geologists and other disciplines as well. 
Wow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking of all the all the ongoing uh, efforts to uh, to to sort out this question of was it a, a, a large impact, uh, may, primarily a, a a major one that you know major pr- crater producing one, or was it a series of smaller Tunguska like events? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's sort of where we're at at the moment to see if there's a link between what's been discovered in uh, in Greenland, the northernmost part of Greenland. Uh, uh, Englefield land is the area that uh, a large crater was discovered uh, by a collaboration between uh, the Danes and, and NASA and uh, trying to figure out what the date of that is, is the current, I think the, the real center of, of the research that's, uh, that may or may not come into uh, come into play in terms of explaining the younger Dryas, it might settle that question. Although the the evidence is still so so odd in its dispersal and the uh, the patterns of dispersal, for example, we see melt glass as a proxy that's very very uh, well accepted as an impact proxy uh, in ver- in a variety of sites, but few. You know, there's a few that have produced melt glass. They're widely distributed, uh, so it's not something that you can rely on being there. But it's it's one of the best, uh, if not the mo- the best of the uh, the lines of evidence we've got. We found on occasion uh, shocked quartz, but it's very very hard to find in in this. Uh, this proxy is very hard to find, and uh, is rare. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're hoping to find a, a place where we can see more of it, but uh, so far we haven't. Uh, that remains, you know, to be followed through. Uh, of course, the microspherals are the, are the most uh, common proxy that we see, or nano diamonds. But the nano diamonds have been in some dispute. I, I, I think it's in, been in dispute somewhat unfairly. But uh, that, I think that'll eventually be proven by the, the presence of the other proxies. Right. Uh, we haven't seen much in the way of microtectites yet. And that's that's a sure sign that we're closing in on, on some of the, uh, uh, the more, the more convincing sites, if you will. Well, in uh, relation to something that you point out there, Malcolm, you know, you you you, you made an allusion to Tunguska. What we saw with Tunguska in 1908 is, to me, very similar, although on obviously a smaller scale, than what we presume occurred around the time of the Younger Dryas, because. There was an airburst. There was no actual impact as far as we know, but there was, of course, widespread devastation throughout the Taiga region there in remote Siberia where this, again, this airburst occurred. Without an impact, we saw the kind of effect, and I can't help but wonder, of course, pending results about the exact dating of the Hiawatha crater that you alluded to there uh, earlier, and we'll touch more on that as well. I can't help but wonder if, A, it could be an airburst we're talking about, which would fairly easily explain the presence of some of the existing proxies, but in the absence of a crater, or perhaps if we had a break apart that occurred where there are some regions where impacts did occur, perhaps Hiawatha, and in other regions where there were merely airbursts that nonetheless had, nonetheless had widespread devastating effects on the landscape below. I mean, it could be a combination, but something very right, similar to right. and much more widespread oh, yeah. than, than Tunguska. Your thoughts? I think... Uh the widespread nature of that, and the in the inhomogeneity in, in the uh, the proxies suggests to me a, a shower of these things. That it wasn't just one airburst; it was many of the Tunguska class or something similar to that. And that's because if you look at Tunguska, what was produced by that that uh, airburst is what we see. And uh, there must have been many of them to see the widespread uh, accumulation of the, of these uh, distribution of these these small proxies. Uh, it, it must have been really, a, as people have said, a bad day. Malcolm, I think, I mean, um, we've talked about this, and I certainly, we're still speculating somewhat about whether there was sort of a, whether this was a result of a fragmented comet or asteroid that, with multiple impacts, multiple airbursts, yeah. you know, in terms of in, in sort of a global scale. And I, But I do think some of the, the recent South American evidence, um, you know, I think that the, some of the evidence that was found at that site uh, in South America, certainly I, I'm not sure that that's necessarily can be tied to Hiawatha, even if Hiawatha yes. is also a YD impact event. Yeah. Uh, and certainly the, the work we, uh, of, uh, of uh, Scott Harris and uh, with these 
large uh, sheets of melt glass that were found in the desert in in, uh, in South America were you know even you know the, also occurs around the time of the Younger Dryas onset, and those are that's clearly from a very low you know sort of Tunguska like airburst, correct? I agree. Yeah. No, no, I think that's the evidence is building that this this event was complex at the very least and does appear to be, you know, widely, a widely distributed series of events of a smaller class than, than the crater producers. Although uh, we we are examining the idea that there are some additional craters that are distributed around. We're actually looking at a site. We're getting a core out of uh, a lake in uh, Nova Scotia that is near a, a uh, what's recognized as an impact feature. Uh, although the age is very indeterminate, uh, it may be similar to what happened in Greenland, except that uh, it was a small isolated uh, ice sheet uh, that was a remnant left behind. Although, you know, it's, it's a long shot, but it may be. We're, we'll get some dates out of that, hopefully, and, and uh, be able to determine whether that crater is related to what, what we're seeing elsewhere. Right. This is one that we think, you know, if it, if it dates to the Younger Dryas, this one went through went through the ice sheet as, as well, right? Correct, Malcolm? Correct, yeah. yeah. In regards to air bursts and, and melt glass and that type of thing, you know, we, the especially for the melt glass, in my mind, that's produced by, you know, uh, air bursts from an object in, you know, fairly low altitude. But, you know, we're sitting here talking about this, and I started to think, is it is it a function of the size of the object that – that causes the air burst or is it more a function of what the surface of the earth is actually like? So, so for example, we've got a Tunguska blast and that's more of a, 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 a tundra type area of for, you know, forested um, kind of a wet, you know, it's kind of wet there. And then you've got in some places where you've got desert and obvious melt glass that they found. Is that, you see where I'm going with that? Is that a function of the yeah. topography of the earth or is it the object? Well, I mean, Malcolm probably needs, should speak to this, but the, the Tunguska event, it knocked down trees, but I don't know there's any, there was no melt, there was no obvious, I mean, I, and I guess there's 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 a reports of fires, wildfires. Yeah, so, there is a mm. there is a report of melt glass, but it's it's not been confirmed, unfortunately. By the way, on the, on the subject of tektites that you mentioned earlier, that being a clear indicator of, uh, what you're looking for in relation to a dryas impact. Uh, we're talking about the same sort of thing. Uh, Almogordo glass, I believe, might be another term for that. Essentially, these are are the glass-like formations that occur from vitrification at the time of in, an impact. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Just so that folks know at home what we're talking about. Here's talking about tektites, extreme heat that causes the vitrification, the sudden melting and then fusing of sand or other, uh, uh, some, most often sand, but uh, other glass-like formations that are found, and these are associated with these impact regions. Um, you know, something that James and I talked about a while back, too, and we should really talk to the, the, the two of you about this. I, I would be interested in knowing if there are any comparative studies in terms of analysis of the Tunguska region in relation to Younger Dryas proxies to see, you know, what the similarities are in relation to weather. And airburst might be uh, the best angle of approach in terms of the Dryas. And also there is that question that many have raised about whether or not it could have been um, that both instances were representative of uh, Earth's passage through the Torrid Stream, I believe. Uh, in other right. words, we have the same uh, we have the same period of of, of, of debris. Uh, the the Earth, same the same parent material. The same parent material, yes, in the debris field that Earth passes through, I believe, on an annual basis, that might at certain times contribute to. Uh, these kinds of events. If that's the case, the obvious implication, and again, I'll air to the judgment of our guests here, but I'd like to pose the question. The obvious in, uh, implication would be that Tunguska and the Dryas might be, might be related in that regard, in which case there's a predictability factor. Uh, could you maybe speak to that a little? <laughs> yeah, I can. I'm just laughing here because I'm thinking to myself, uh, yeah, they're so similar that um, you could draw that conclusion that they are related. Uh, the proxies are quite similar. If you look at the spherules, they're indistinguishable, the microspherules I'm talking about. Uh, they, they appear to be the same material, uh, same, uh, they have the same structure, uh, same patterns. Uh, you can't tell a, a Tunguska microspherule from a, a YDB's microspherule. Right. Um, so, they, so they have the, they both have a terrestrial chemical signature primarily 
Yeah. Right. You know, they're, they're iron, they're magnetic microspherules, and, and uh, there's nothing exotic as far as I know about them. But uh, do they differ significantly from other impact regions and the materials retrieved from them? Yeah, you, you tend to see more glass in some in some areas, and we're starting to see glass in in uh, in some of our our sites. But uh, once again, the glass is rare, as are the, as is the melt glass. Uh, huh. So I think that the glass just doesn't last as long, and the further afield you go, the, the less you have, and and uh, the, you get higher concentrations. It, it persists, perhaps. Uh, maybe that's the clue. We've seen, like I say, we've seen a couple of sites that have both the melt glass and the glass spherules. And hopefully we'll see more. Yeah, absolutely. You know, guys, in relation to what we're talking about here, and now that we've got Malcolm on the show with us, Chris, last time we spoke with you at the illustrious White Pond Lodge and uh, Four Star Resort and Spa, we, yeah. we talked a little about the most recent Chilean studies that have been coming out at that time. But uh, maybe right. maybe we can, we can tie that in before we get into some of the other papers that have been published uh, in recent months. Now that we have both of you here, because, again, many of these same proxies have been discovered at the Chilean uh, side of Pilauco, I believe, and right. and and perhaps there are ongoing studies there that are indicating similar things uh, in the adjacent region and other parts of South America. But let's let's speak a little about the the uh, the paper that you guys co-authored in relation to Chilean studies and uh, the YDB proxies retrieved there. My my part of that was fairly minor, but you know, looking at the the, the platinum anomaly again uh, was certainly was a very clear boundary. There's a very clear YD boundary. Uh, at that site, um, uh, with, a, with a large platinum anomaly, the, the platinum to palladium ratio that we're seeing at so many of these sites, sort of indicating, you know, there's natural, very low level platinum. All it, all of the sites we've looked at, it, it, there tends to be very low level parts per billion platinum. Uh, certainly at the at the the site uh, in South America, uh, there was there was that was the case and. There was also a, there was a, a Malcolm could probably speak to this in terms of the spirals. Uh, they were, if I'm not mistaken, they were able to identify you know uh, spirals that related to volcanism because there was you know that in that location there's a there's a volcanic component to the sediments uh, that they were sort of able to isolate uh, and differentiate from the likely YDB impact spirals. But there's also there's platinum there's there's impact spirals in the YDB layer there's melt. If I'm not mistaken, there's melt, melt, melt glass. Uh, again, some of the things sort of indicating that that probably, you know, the for example, Hiawatha, if it's younger, driest in age, or other impacts in the northern hemisphere, may or not may or may not have directly contributed to what we're seeing at that site, hmm. which again suggests that there were more than one impact. Yeah. Chris, one more thing, too, really quickly. And Malcolm, you'd be the guy to talk to about this, because uh, Jason and I, when we spoke to you recently on the telephone, we discussed uh, volcanic activity in relation to impacts. Chris, are you saying that there appears to be uh, separate evidence of separate uh, volcanic uh, activity occurring around the time of the Dryas? And, and Malcolm, if you'd rather respond to this, that's that's fine as well. I'm just trying to understand if that was separate from the impact proxies that you think you found at that location. Yeah. Here's my, my understanding, and this this uh, it, it, we're still struggling with this. What we have is a clear signal of the of the classic uh, microspherules that we see elsewhere in the YDB at the YDB. Uh, above that, you get into layers of sediment closer to the surface, where there appears to be a component of uh, of the terrain that's volcanic. So it may be that this this was was deposited over time and this is something that we see elsewhere where you have a specific layer that starts at the younger dryas you have these spherules that begin at the they're present at the younger dryas but not below and then you go up in 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 depth and then you begin to see other things uh particularly anthropogenic spherules that are sometimes indistinguishable from from the uh the ones that are impact created and, uh, and in this case, we may be seeing a post-deposition of, of spherules that were created in, at other, other places nearer the volcanic uh, sources, which have a distinct uh, chemical composition, or they may be 
spherules that were produced directly out of the volcano. That that does not seem likely to me, just because the volcanoes don't really, you don't, they're not typically producing spherules like the Ember Dry spherules. They're typically a bit different. James is shaking yeah. his head here too. Geologist seems to agree. Could that be related to what we discussed with you previously, Jason, and you and I, uh, with relation to some studies that may suggest volcanic activity in relation to an impact? I don't think so. I think, okay. in my mind, I guess I'm thinking that this is more a, a post-depositional or a post-impact deposition uh, over time that this stuff washes in or, or uh, you know, from another area. Gotcha. Okay. It's blown in, whatever. Uh, I mean, really thinking, you know, speculating wildly here uh, for this topic it may even be that there are other, you know, as we pass through the stream at other other points, there may be uh, other events. But I think the, the redeposition is more likely. And you mean other events in terms of not related other temporally? The comp- at the- when the topic we came up before, uh, just a few minutes ago, that – you guys should uh, should inquire if you can get Bill Napier on the on the uh, on the podcast because he'd be right. a great source for for uh, elaborating on uh, on the likelihood and, and the possibility of repeated passes through the torrid stream and and what that was what what it derived from and and uh, what its likely history was or future uh, for that so matter. Actually- <laughs> I said, or future for that matter, because if it's happened that many times before, presumably it may happen again. <laughs> well, right. that's, that's a thought. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, there's some ideas that if, it was, if this was a fragmented comet out of the Taurus stream, as Napier has, and others have talked about that, you know, we might have had a series of impacts over a number of years. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we don't, in many cases, we simply don't have the resolution with the possible exception of the ice core data, we just simply, for most of the sites we look at, we don't have the resolution to make that determination. Yeah, I was going to, I yeah. literally was going to ask you that question. If you had that resolution, if you could see, you know, if this went, if this every year that the earth went through the torrid stream in October or whenever it is, this happened every year for 10 years, could you be able to tell? And I guess the answer is no. No, I don't think so. But I know um, from the original Pateo of Greenland record of the platinum anomaly, I think they they saw there was certainly evidence of, you know, there was a large amount of of platinum, presumably platinum rich material, platinum rich dust that was injected into the atmosphere, that remained in the atmosphere and, and presumably rained out over a number of years. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're able to see that in the in the ice core record. I forget if it was uh, 21 years, uh, sort of a you know with a peak, and then a decline. Uh, which I know, if I'm not mistaken, they, they may have even implied possibly multiple injections, um, but of of platinum rich material into the atmosphere over that period of time. But again, maybe only for a, a few decades at most. And and to revisit this idea that uh, that the the character of the of the spherules changes as you go towards the surface. Remember that there's there's bound to be a point at which you reach the anthropogenic com- uh, component, and that may be uh, locally sourced, due to locally sourced material as well. So, uh, you know, if if the volcanic rocks in the area have a particular uh, composition that's different than what we see at the younger driest boundary, then it may be some process that's going on there, uh, smelting or something that that's producing those, and they're they're working their way down into into the column, uh, but. This brings up a point that I think is not well understood, is that, like I said before, the uh, you see the onset of the Ember Dryas proxies at a specific time. Uh, Lake Hind is a good example of that. And then Excellent. you see really weird patterns of, of uh, re, redeposition, if you will, or, or redistribution of the same proxies as you go up the column. And, uh, and that can make things very confusing and, and lead to this misinterpretation that, well, spherules are throughout the column. Right. They, these things do not occur normally throughout the column unless there's some some process that's reworking them. Right. Uh, and that's typically a sedimentologist will tell you that that uh, you know that they they understand those processes uh, and they're very, sometimes be very complex. Yeah, well, uh, exactly. And my first experience with that was my, the very first site with Malcolm that I had. He, I, basically, he showed me how to how to to find uh, spirals was at Squires Ridge on the, one of the Tor River sites that I worked on for my dissertation. 
And at Squirrels Ridge, there's a large peak in spirals that at depth that is that is certainly consistent with younger dryas or very close to the younger dryas. But then there's a distribution of spirals and maybe secondary peaks that continue all the way up the, the column. We're talking, you know, roughly a meter meter thick of, uh, of sand. Uh, and at the very top, there's very clear evidence of a large peak in anthropogenic, you know, presumably, you know, coal burning, uh, industrial fly ash types of microspirals um, right. that we're seeing, it, you know, near the surface. But, you know, at depth, you can act the chemically, when you look at these things, uh, they sort of lump together by depth. The anthropogenic spirals, you know, or cluster together at the surface. There's others, there's weird spirals, you know, going on as you go down the column and the, what we think are younger dry spirals look very similar chemically. Um, and probably what's going on there as well as other sites, we don't find any spirals above the layer in Squires Ridge that we think dates to the younger dryas. We, it, we find, I mean, below, we don't find any, any spirals below it yet. They're all, they're all above, which suggested to me that the sediments at Squires Ridge are being reworked through secondary, you know, processes, you know, large scale flood events, uh, per, perhaps uh, wind blown, you know, uh, Aeolian uh, deflation and redeposition of sand over the millennia, which is basically salting the entire column with microspirals. Interesting. We, we've been accused of finding things that are not uh, high temperature proxies, uh, which is what the microspirals are. Uh, the temperatures are fairly high to produce these things, and and uh, there are other spherules or spheral spherulitic objects, uh, part particles that are produced by natural uh, biologic and, and natural uh, geochemistry that look very different than what we see. Right. I think uh, one of those criticisms had been that uh, you guys might have been looking at insect dung and things like that, but we're quite obviously talking about something different with relation to the YDB spherules, right? Yeah. This is something I think, you know, if Malcolm wants to do this, I mean, he clearly, this is maybe one point of, of clarification and, and clarity for some people in terms of the misunderstanding that some of the critical papers that have come out in terms of how they identified so-called mm -hmm. spirals, right? Yeah. <clears throat> right, and the whole notion of impact spirals versus what are called framboids, which are non-impact uh, related, and the whole, and the idea that you you can identify these things that look like spirals with an optical microscope, but you have to use scanning electron mi uh, microscope to to truly identify them as an impact spiral. I think, you know, that, that Malcolm, you want to speak more to that, that would be, yeah. I think, something really good to do here. Please. The features on the surface, there's there's two things, I think, that make them distinctive. The first is the features that you see on the, on the magnetic microspherals are clearly and well known to be uh, a crystallization, uh, due to a crystallization process that occurs when you have something in a molten state or a vaporized state, in essentially molten or boiling, and it, it rapidly uh, cools. And uh, you have these dendritic features that clearly are different than what you see in the soil that is produced naturally by either uh, natural biochem or, you know, biochemistry or, or natural uh, geochemistry uh, that occur over a long periods of time and, and at room temperature or whatever the temperature of the soil may be. But yeah, they're very easily distinguished. And if you look at a microscope, it's very difficult to tell one from the other. And the only way to do that is to look through a, an electron microscope to see those features. The other way that can be they can be distinguished is if you see a, a glass spherule, and that is clearly not something that's produced uh, by either biogenic or, or uh, uh, you know, geo, uh, geochemistry over long periods of time, especially when you see uh, clear evidence of melting on the surface of, of inclusions that are uh, merging into the matrix. Uh, and these things, these glass spherules, I mean, glass itself uh, is going to have a melting temperature somewhere around 1700 C if it's, if it's, if it's a quartz, uh, quartz composition. So 1700 C is not something you you see in in house fires or or uh, your typical even your typical anthropogenic uh, stuff. You got to have a pretty high temperature uh, furnace to be producing that kind of a temperature. I'd say. So, yeah, and you got to have more than just the temperature. You have to have the physical processes 
to move that material around to cause it to, you know, become spherules. Now, one thing I was going to ask you, and correct me if I'm wrong, but aren't the spherules hollow in some cases? In some cases, they are. Also, in some cases, when you get past the surface, you see extremely oxygen poor, which means they were produced in a in a near vacuum environment, very very low pressure uh, atmospheric environment, which suggests a shock wave. Uh, oxygen depleted, very heavily oxygen depleted uh, composition, whereas the exterior has obviously obviously been oxidized over time. Malcolm, would that indicate fire as well that might be one of the sources of consumption of oxygen at the time of the impact? I think it's reasonable, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would think that, and a lot of times, well, I'll give you some of my background. Other than being a geologist, I'm also a retired combat engineer, so I'm pretty familiar with explosions. And very large explosions actually cause vacuum conditions at the point of the explosion. Oh, huh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> So, so, so we could identify this again as being a superheated, but also a, a vacuum environment as a result of a uh, explosive condition that occurred in this presumably fairly instantaneously, right? Yeah, yeah. These things are produced very, very quickly, uh, and essentially vaporized uh, crust is what we're actually seeing. The composition is crustal, and this vaporized crust. I mean, imagine a. Uh, uh, a vapor made of molten lead or molten uh, iron. Uh, that's what that's what you're dealing with. It's essentially, the particulates that have rained out from that uh, from that event. And again, uh, one of the several critical papers that that have come out over the last few years, where people have gone back and either tried to replicate evidence from YDB sites or looked at other sites and either and, and identified. In some cases, what they call spirals, but they've only done that with optical uh, microscopy and with, without doing any electron microscope analysis. I think I don't know that anybody has done the SEM work, uh, Malcolm, right? Other than uh, well, Andronikov has, and he's identified it. Uh, uh, yeah, right. Andronik- Andronikov was doing it correctly, I believe. Yeah, and uh, Dick Laub did up at. Uh, in uh, University, I'm sorry, Buffalo Museum of Science. Uh, and his, he did a paper very early on uh, that looked at a, a a layer of poorly dated soil, rather turbated, but found the basically found the proxies, did an analysis in, in the composition. Uh, there's a couple of others who have done it as well, but I don't think anybody has, has done as many of them as as those of us in the in the younger I mean, Alan and and uh, and I and a couple of others, perhaps. Right. When you do the SEM work, the scanning electron microscope, and you use that to analyze these samples, is it analyze just the the physical features of the samples or the spherules, or does it also do you get uh, information on the on the uh, chemical makeup as well? If you have a uh, if you have the uh, the ability to do it's it's essentially X ray anal- X ray spectrographic analysis, uh, and uh, you can tell the the uh, chemical composition pretty well. It's not extremely sensitive, but it's but it gives you uh, a pretty decent uh, measurement of, of the composition of the of the objects that we're dealing with. Uh, okay. For all practices, you won't find the platinum unless it's really abundant, and we haven't. I don't think we've seen much of that. Yeah. But uh, but it'll give you the iron content and the oxygen content. Right. Right, it's in, 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 energy dispersive spec, spectrometry, right? Is that right? EDS. Well, right. Yeah. Thank you. Most of what, right. <laughs> I tell you what, you guys, you guys bring the bacon because we knew this would be a, be a good conversation. I'm sure there are going to be a lot of folks at home who are going to be on Google looking up some of these terms. It's a very, very dense and science-rich conversation we are having with Christopher or R. Moore, Ph.D., and Malcolm LeCompte, Ph.D. These two are, I tell you what, I mean, they're blowing my mind a little, but I'm also looking. I, I know Jason. When Jason starts getting quiet like this, which is rare on these podcasts, I know he's thinking, and it, it's hard not to listen to these. This commentary, the science is is interesting in itself, but the broader implications here are very wide reaching. I mean, there 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 are existential concerns that come into play here. We have, Absolutely. yeah. I mean, we we've got a lot of things, and actually, you know, Jason, maybe I'll, I'll let you jump in with a little of that because again. This is something that I know that the team and I on the road, when we're when we're going out to sites like White Pond, we've had this conversation so many times trying to, to imagine what would it have been like in the Paleo-Indian American environment 
on that really bad day when all this goes down. And you're right. I'm processing information over here, but I'm also thinking about this, the entirety and the enormity of the discussion here. And so much has came out since the last episode we had on the YD Impact. Uh, so many papers have come forward and, and the evidence continues to build. There's just so much to cover here tonight. Uh, we want to make sure that we're uh, trying to get it all in. But returning for a moment to the Hiawatha Crater. Now, before that paper came out, there was a lot of buildup around the Hiawatha Crater. There was a lot of excitement, I know, on our end because we knew of the forthcoming information and we were excited to see what was going to be produced by that paper. So for those listening who may not be completely up to speed on everything YD Impact, um, just know that the Hiawatha Crater uh, or what's located in the Hiawatha Glacier, and it's in uh, northwest Greenland. Um, it was done with airborne radar surveys, and it's about a 31-kilometer wide circular bedrock depression, um, and it, it's it's beneath up to a kilometer of ice. Now, the radio stratigraphy of the ice in the crater shows that Holocene ice is continuous to that point. Um, now, that in itself is of great interest. So my question to you, and maybe I'll throw this to uh, to Malcolm to begin, where are we at with the research at Hiawatha, and have we gotten any more certain about whether or not it's actually related to the YD impact? We have hints, and I really can't, I don't think uh, I need, I, I can discuss more than that. I know that they they feel that, uh, that this is a, a recent crater. Um, how recent? is subject to a fair amount of debate, but uh, the Holocene ice appears to, is, is what you'd expect, but the, the ice below it shows the possibility of, of perhaps a, uh, a melting uh, disturbance that would suggest that it's, it's quite young uh, and perhaps young or dryish young. But, uh, you know, they, the Danes and, and uh, their American collaborators and German collaborators, I might add as well, uh, it's an ongoing story. They're doing their own research. We're we're pursuing a, a different avenue to try to make that connection, and uh, we're being teased by the possibility, but we don't know. We have nothing to uh, to, to hang our hat on at this point. <laughs> yeah, and even when it's left to speculation at times like this, quite obviously, um, we want to be careful about reading too much into things. But it seems very likely that there's a good possibility that we've got a large impact feature. Uh, as far as its its northern orientation, I mean that that's a very unique place for an impact as well, uh, if that is indeed what it is. But it quite obviously appears to be, uh, and if the fresh Holocene ice buildup, the accumulation of that ice on that feature is any indication, it would definitely seem that that's at least a leading candidate. But again, with relation to the Tunguska discussion we had earlier, I'm to the point now where I'm very confident that we can make the case for an event with or without a direct impact, although in likelihood we have one or more. Uh, yeah. But we wouldn't yeah. need that to be able to explain the features that relate to this. So if that were the case, at some point, would we, would we ever end up modifying, guys, the name from uh, YDB impact to being the, the Younger Dryas um, boundary event, maybe? I don't know. That's well, sort of what we think about it now, as it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I still don't know, know we can characterize it. Right. And even if uh, even if Hiawatha can be demonstrated to be to be younger dry onset, in a way that would be the sort of the smoking gun and for a lot of people I think it would sort of for many of us we feel that we've already we're already past that, but for others it would seal the deal in terms of them accepting that, that there was an impact. But I'm not sure that that Hiawatha as big as it is by itself necessarily can explain everything that's being seen globally. Yeah, you know what's interesting though is whether or not that is related to the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis, we nonetheless have what appears to be an impact feature right there on the Greenland ice sheet. And even if it is yeah. unrelated to the YDB, that's quite an impact uh, feature in itself. So I mean, that's that's something that to me would be a, a a very interesting avenue of independent study if it were ever found not to be related to what we're looking at here, because a that means there has to be another mechanism that explains the event we're discussing. And two, right. uh, that was a pretty big impact, and it has some very unique features. You know, yeah. I know that Jason wants to get into the discussion of a little uh, coronal mass ejection here before we wrap up, but there are a couple of other sites that I think really we need to talk with you guys about while we've got you both here. Uh, one of them came up in the conversation already, Lake Hind. Can we talk a little bit about that? And I know that there was publication of a paper about this site last year, right? 
Yeah, that, that was the result of, uh, well, I guess I started working on my part of it about 2008. Uh, there were a lot of people doing different parts of this, and uh, it's it's a it was a big project and a very hard one because the story was really difficult to unravel. And uh, we see that same pattern where you have uh, a layer where the spherules appear and some of the other proxies, the platinum, and in fact, an iridium anomaly, as long, along with the platinum anomaly. And they all begin around the Younger Dryas, what we date to be the Younger Dryas, or, or what looks to be the Younger Dryas, uh, uh, with carbon dating. And, and, uh, and what we see is what appears to be evidence of massive flooding. This was, by the way, this paper is about a site that's right in the, it's like a, a, uh, a satellite lake to Lake Agassiz. Uh -huh. So this is kind of a just off Lake Agassiz. And it's, I guess it's kind of like a, a bellwether to what Lake Agassiz is doing when it's flooding, uh, when it may be filling and then, and then flooding. And the record appears to indicate that uh, this, this thing, when this thing happened, there was a catastrophic failure and a flood that occurred that emptied out into the uh, uh, the Mackenzie River uh, basin uh, up in the north. And at the same time that, that we have that evidence, we have simultaneous failure of of ice dams in a, in a variety of places and a flood coming out of the uh, of the Arctic Ocean uh, that appears to be what triggered the Younger Dryas, this massive climate change by uh, presumably cutting off the thermal haline circulation, uh, drop the temperatures back back into something approaching what the, what they were at the last glacial maximum. Yeah. So and that's the mechanism by which this impact really caused some havoc. Now, a couple uh, of points right there. Uh, Malcolm, forgive me for interrupting. A couple of points there. Yeah. What you're describing is a long known, and for listeners at home who may be interested in this, a long known feature of the younger Dryas hypothesis, you know, completely apart from the idea of there being an impact related to it, because researchers have known for a long time that there, and there was, again, I believe, paleogeological data that supported the idea that meltwater from the ice caps running into the North Atlantic disrupts that term you used, the thermohaline. Circulation. In other words, we are seeing a disruption of the currents in the ocean that causes the cool air pockets and also a concomitant warm air pocket in certain other uh, certain other areas that occur during this driest period. So we have again what some have referred to. I think Wally Brecker and others would call it the uh, the model for abrupt climate change in the ancient world. Uh, all these factors, for a long time, if I understand correctly, Malcolm would have been considered to be. Uh, simply geological factors and and the result of Earth's exit from the Pleistocene into the Holocene as being what caused the driest. But then we find these proxies, like the platinum, and very interestingly, you mentioned there being an iridium abundance at that site as well, which I haven't heard about that yet. Well, yeah, that, that's that's the evidence is published in the paper, and it was actually it was found the iridium at, at Lake Hine was was originally reported in the first Younger Dryas paper, and then it was dismissed as someone another uh, group did a took a sample, found an anomaly, but felt it was it was statistically uh, uh, insignificant, uh -huh. and uh, dismissed it. But they did find an anomaly. It was just much lower than the anomaly that had been found originally. Chris, is that and, what had sent them to the Greenland ice sheets when when proxy cores were actually? I'm sorry, not Greenland. I guess there were there were other locations too. But there were there were cores that were drilled. Were they not looking for? And you told us about this once. Iridium right. initially, right? Yeah, right. The the you know with Wally, I think you know certainly uh, played a big role in, in getting the the ice for the the group in 2013. Uh, from the Greenland Ice uh, Sheet Project 2 core for the Pateo team to look, they, they were looking for iridium. Mm -hmm. or at least initially, they were like, okay, you know, Wally was very skeptical. And, he, and basically, I think with Kenneth, he wanted to show Kenneth, and Malcolm may be able to speak more directly to this, but he wanted to show that, look, there was no, there's no, this, nothing happened. There's no evidence on the ice sheet. We looked. Well, they, they were looking for iridium, thinking, well, that's probably the more likely thing if there was an impact, thinking back to, you know, the, the KPG 66 million year dinosaur extinction event where the iridium layers are common. 
but they were looking for iridium. They didn't find much iridium in the ice core, but they when they did wind up finding the very large platinum anomaly. Um, but and so it's interesting they didn't get much iridium in that study. But there's been several YDB sites where we where we have reported uh, elevated iridium. Okay, not surprising. Every, and, and you mentioned the Cretaceous Tertiary boundary again. When when the Alvarez team initially determined that we had an impact event that likely killed the dinosaurs, there was, again, a iridium uh, abundance at that location. This would be the significance of, of course, why when they find iridium at sites like Lake Hind, they're very interested right off the bat, correct? And then they go right. looking for it elsewhere but end up finding another rare earth element, platinum. Yeah, there was some discussion. It's like, well, this is unusual. And so they, they in the paper, the Greenland team when they found the iridium they said well this is this is a very unusually fractionated core of a comet or whatever hit asteroid that hit uh but yet they thought the most likely source of that platinum was still an extraterrestrial uh, you know impactor uh but and so to them maybe the, you know maybe the evidence is uh maybe we you know if we had more younger dry ice from the ice cores which is is not the case Quite often, but if we had more, we maybe it might be worth going back to look and see if we do have in some of the samples, you know, elevated iridium in 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 what we would expect, you know, in addition to the platinum that they found for the simple reason that at Lake Hind and at other sites, you know, elevated iridium has been found. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I have to say that the the amount of iridium or the amount of platinum at at the uh, in the in the Greenland core. Was was not one that you'd attribute to a, a lar as large an impactor as as you find at Hiawatha Crater. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just it's yeah. a mystery as to why the the amount is as low as it is when we've got it spread all over the, the continent. It appears, or at least a couple continents. Uh, that's a mystery. That mm -hmm. that makes me think about the the you know the other the archaeological sites. It's highly variable. Yeah, and and, and that, that might relate, and maybe it's true for the ice as well. They're looking at a pretty small piece of ice, and you know, there even even within the ice, there's likely, you know, there's variable deposition atmospherically on the ice. There's potentially post depositional processes that affect the you know the you know the concentration of of platinum or possibly even iridium in in the particular ice sample they're looking at. We see you know. At Flamingo Bay, for example, we had, you know, extremely high platinum concentration. I think it was the highest at the time for any site in North America. Uh, and at other sites, we would get platinum anomalies at the Younger Dryas boundary that that were the highest in the in the entire record for the that we looked at, but but only barely above background. Hey, Chris uh, and Malcolm, your thoughts on this would be appreciated, too. I've seen uh, some critics, uh, you know, for instance, Mark DeFont being the volcanologist who had commented on this in an article, uh, he had mentioned that there might be other processes that could account for a, an abundance of platinum like that. Uh, would you agree that that's the case uh, in, in relation to there being other mechanisms apart from an extraterrestrial impact or airburst that would facilitate oh. that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, volcanism is a is a known contributor. We we tried to address that some to some degree in the platinum paper. It's it's buried in the supplemental, but we we tested we tested tephras and, and volcanic materials from all over the world among uh, known volcanic sources that could have possibly contributed platinum. Well, both to probably the Greenland ice core, but also to the, the North American archaeological sites. Mm -hmm. And we found platinum elevated platinum in some in some of the volcanic tephras. Uh, in every case, and uh, they were the the amount of platinum in, in the ones that we tested was lower than the peak amounts of platinum that we're getting, for example, <clears throat> at Flamingo Bay. So you know you would have to you know presumably Flamingo Bay is a extremely far removed from the nearest volcanic source of platinum, yet the platinum anomaly there is higher than what we get when we when we test the volcanic materials directly. Hmm. I see. So it's unlikely from that reason alone that the platinum is coming in. But we've also there's also been tests looking at things like sulfur anomalies, uh, microscopic tephra, crypto tephra. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my colleagues, uh, co-authors on the White Pond paper, 
I sent him samples across the YD boundary to look for crypto tephra particles because he was he's been able to find that at other North American sites from cascade uh, volca volcanic events uh, traveling all the way across the continent. The t you know microscopic particles, and so I thought, well, this would be great. You know, if they're there at White Pond, they're probably going to be microscopic. And if they're in the platinum layer, then that would maybe indicate that the platinum is coming from volcanic events. Well, he found only only two or three shards of of, of crypto tephra in any of the samples that he looked at, and none of them were in the Younger Dryas layer. Interesting. That's very interesting. So it it definitely seems that a distinction could be made between the idea of volcanic activity and whatever the causal agent behind the Dryas impact is. Jason, do you want to jump in there? Yeah, well, you know, as we're approaching the, the end of the conversation here, I want to make sure in the in the spirit of being as thorough as possible, uh, I want to look at some of the alternative theories on what some of these uh, proxies may be the result of. Um, recently, and I would say in the last six months, I've heard a lot of talk, uh, mostly championed by Dr. Robert Schock, geologist from uh, Boston University, who we greatly respect his work, but he uh, respectfully disagrees with the YD impact, uh, stating in various interviews that there's no definitive comet impact uh, to be accounted for. Uh, he claims that there's other ways to get the PT anomaly, other ways to get nano diamonds, um, even stating that the Hiawatha crater itself spans two million years. Um, the timing is off for the megafaunal extinctions, and he points to a uh, coronal mass ejection. And mm -hmm. when he's just Talking about that as a theory or a hypothesis, he's pointing to solar proton events, um, electrical discharges creating vitrification of stone, uh, electrical storms that he claims can cause craters, that can melt glaciers, that can warm large mm. bodies of water. And his evidence for that is, for the coronal mass ejection that is, is the biomass burning, the vitrification, earthquake activities, um, all of those things is, is what he's pointing, basically using the same proxies that we're discussing here, but for a coronal mass ejection rather than an impact. Um, he claims beryllium and carbon isotopes present in ice cores are there, but they're created not by a comet impact, but by a coronal mass ejection. And then finally, even to things such as petroglyphic evidence, referring to the Rongo Rongo texts of Easter Island as plasma configurations that they would have witnessed during a coronal mass ejection. So that's a lot of information that's kind of all over the place. But yeah. is there anything to the coronal mass ejection theory that's now beginning to gain a little bit of a, of a following? And what are your thoughts on that? Malcolm, we'll begin with you. Well, you know, at this stage in our research, I think we've we've got a pretty good hypothesis. But I wouldn't dis I wouldn't discount or dismiss what uh, what shock is proposing or, or attempting to do if he. You know, the more evidence, all you've got to do is follow the evidence. I mean, that's the best. That's all we can do, and uh, and see where it leads. Uh, so I wouldn't discourage that uh, that approach or that uh, that hypothesis. I think it's just going to be a matter of who has who provides comes up with the best evidence for uh, for which which mechanism. I think right now we still uh, have a pretty consistent story that seems to be developing fairly well. Uh, we'll see if this, you know, if the Hiawatha crater is connected. We'll see if these teasers are just that, and, and have nothing, nothing substantial comes from them. Uh, what what strikes me is that we've we'd have to have a date and a production of these proxies that is is every bit as extensive as we see. So I don't know. Uh, at this point, I just think we don't know, and all we can do is keep working. It's not about necessarily anyone being out to prove anyone else wrong, but, you know, move the research together in, in a cooperative manner. And so uh, there's still much to learn as we begin to look at what's coming up. Is there anything that you guys can share with us uh, as far as the next stage of the YD Impact research? Well, uh, I think we're both looking at, at more sites, uh, but I think that that approach to this is, is, uh, perhaps winding down if and may wind down if the the Hiawatha crater comes in as a, as a younger dryas event then as you say it's probably more accepted and then uh, the uh, the fact that we've got these these other indicators of a widespread uh, 
anomalous event where you've got a shower of these things coming in distributed across the landscape uh, of a good at least a hemisphere of the earth if not more uh, than this it may be that the, the focus of the research shifts shifts to Africa, South South America, and maybe even Asia. So those are the possible ways to go. I know we're we're connected to other lines of research that will lead us to, to other sites from that period. Maybe we'll find more and get more get a get a better uh, read on on the nature of the event. I'm thinking in terms right. of the Bowser Road site right now, which was really illuminating in so many ways. Yeah, maybe we could touch on that also. I don't yeah. think we've discussed that really yet. Well, this is Mike Gramley's site. Uh, it was a mastodon. At first, it was seen as a as a scavenge site, and then the, the evidence began to build that it was a kill site. And what's been unique about the archaeology, and I think I, I probably is better spoken to by Chris, but it is one of the best of the uh, of the proxy sites it's got melt glass it's got the spherules it's got a platinum anomaly it's a really amazing site the only problem with it is that it's too shallow it's uh it's only about uh 30 centimeters down um 40 at the most and uh although there are some some deeper pockets that we can go to as sort of time capsules uh frost uh, cracks ground wedges the like around the around the carcass but it's in a lake in in uh, southern new york new york state orange county um just one of the many mastodons that was that was uh, pulled out of of that county i think there's something like 70 mastodons have been excavated from that but the, the archaeology from the site is is virtually groundbreaking i mean it's changing the, i think the changing the perspective on on clovis by shifting the emphasis or possibly shifting the emphasis away from lithic technology to to bone technology right and that on at, at that site you you found micro spirals and these other proxies really draped on top of the bones isn't that right that is correct yeah and the and the, the abundances were amazing i mean they were really high abundances thousands of spirals per kilo and they and they and they ready carbon dated the bone or or Remind me again what the, they got a, a radiocarbon date from the three separate samples of uh, of collagen from from the tusk, right? And they came in essentially identical. Yeah. And it's uh, thirteen thousand, I think it was thirteen thousand fifty plus or minus uh, something like fifty years. I, I have the book here, but I have to go back and, and look at it. Uh, but it's clearly uh, been draped. The the proxies were draped over the carcass. Right. And, uh, and then taper off as you go up in depth, and uh, and then as you go down into the, these frost cracks or these uh, these ice uh, ground wedges, ice wedges and ground wedges, what you find is is enhancements to this stuff. When these things are active, when it's very cold, and evidently the material fell in fell in there, and uh, and it was preserved. Whereas you go in in the undisturbed soil, and, and they're gone. They're just not there. Right. Uh, so, so it just strikes me that this is this is an event that uh, was clearly mirrored at that site, and as well as all the amazing archaeological uh, implications of what has what's been found there. Uh, I wanted to end with one thing too. Uh, going back to uh, the ex- you know what we knew about the Younger Dryas onset uh, before. Wally Broker, as I understand it, Wally Broker once made the comment that this is when he was a skeptic, you know, avowed a skeptic of, of the impact event mechanism. He doesn't believe that it was impact created, but he doesn't know what created it. So that gives you an idea that the characteristics that you see revealed in the in the evidence of the onset of the Emerdryas were not really understood. The rapidity of the onset and and the widespread nature of the effects that were felt. I think was a mystery, and this impact event does the possibility of an impact event does seem to bring a lot of that together, especially when you consider that uh, I guess it's been found recently, and it was a give, paper given by Jim Kennett that uh, the ice sheets and the Scandian ice sheets had ice dams that failed at about the same time as the as the Laurentide did. Parts of the Laurentide failed. The, the ice dams mm-hmm. on this side of the planet. We're failing at about the same time as they were on the other side of the planet, effectively in the, in, within the same time frame. Right. So 
gives you an idea of a fairly dramatic event. Absolutely. A dramatic yeah. event is an understatement and one of a global scope. And if we want to understand, again, I mean, not to sound like a doom speaker here, but really, I mean, this could have a whole lot to do ex uh, existentially for the future of humankind. And so if we want to know our future, perhaps we should understand the potential that this area of study holds. And then also we can try and further our knowledge of how to prevent those things. But as G.I. Joe said, knowing is half the battle. I want to thank both of you guys for being here and being a part of this conversation. Chris, we've had you back many times, and this will be one of many I'm sure that we'll do with you in the future. Malcolm, you'll always have a home here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal, and thank you both for your diligence and your research. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for having us. Special thanks again to Dr. Chris Moore and Dr. Malcolm LeCompte. I certainly hope to have both of those gentlemen join us again in the future. Chris, of course, he is already alumni. I'm certain this won't be the last time we talk with Malcolm. And, you know, I hope we are able to support the research that those guys are doing, the ongoing research in any way that we can. It's certainly important. And I would direct people, if you'd like to learn a little more about what they do, over to actually, the best way probably to do this is just Google the Comet Research Group. That's going to bring you to their page. There is a website where they feature some of this information. Now, you know, for my own part, guys, as you know, it should be said that there are still a lot of different ideas about the Younger Dryas. I guess you might say that the sort of traditional model that is endorsed by many paleoclimatologists and geologists is that these are natural processes that occur as we are leaving a ice age like the Plasticine, and that these sort of temperature ups and downs are things that are going to occur. Uh, many geologists have posited the idea that meltwater runoff into the Atlantic Ocean disrupts the thermohaline circulation, and that that could actually account for most of the phenomena being described. But are you familiar with, and this is kind of interesting, and again, I don't, I don't want to even assert that I'm putting weight behind one theory more than another, but I want to bring to the table, because I don't think I've ever talked about it with you guys, uh, the idea that a magnetic pole shift occurring right around that time may also have influenced the Younger Dryas. Are you guys familiar with that theory? I've heard that, but I don't know enough about it to make really any substantial comment. But what I will say is, um, as far as natural processes go, I even consider it, it, an extraterrestrial impact to the Earth part of natural processes. Oh, that's well, sure. Kind of the dynamics of the solar system, you know, the universe at large, I guess. Yes, it's it's certainly a natural process, one that is affected by an extraterrestrial object, but nonetheless, yeah, a natural process. Now, um, in relation to this magnetic theory, I mean, all it would entail, and I mention it only because I recently came upon it, mentioned in a science paper I was reading actually a couple of different papers I was reading about the Younger Dryas, but the general contention is that we know that there are periodic magnetic reversals that occur where a sort of pole shift happens. And there's a lot of really kind of conspiracy-oriented thinking that has been applied to this, you know, into the Mayan calendar type stuff. Putting all that aside, I mean, the fundamental process that we're discussing is something that is known to geologists. And in fact, the kind of earmarks that are left in various geological deposits, these things can be used to discern certain information about the past and at times has helped us even define different geological eras. But yeah. interestingly, yeah. around 12,000 years ago, it's speculated that one of these reversals occurred. And so some climate researchers have pointed this out and said, you know, that's right around the time of the Younger Dryas. Could there be some sort of a relationship there too? One of the other things, though, that I've wondered, guys, and I've said this to you many times, could it have been a number of different factors that strangely all occurring around the same time caused this very unique, again, what some researchers have called the model for abrupt climate change in the ancient world? However you interpret it, 
There's clearly a mystery here, and we are still working toward trying to understand exactly what caused it. Yeah, you know, just as we discussed at the beginning of the show, rarely are these things very you know, cut and dry. It's it's always more complicated than you think it is, um, regardless if it's human migrations, if it's, you know, something as dramatic uh, and dynamic as the Younger Dryas impact. It's it's probably not something so clear cut. I, it seems like there was a lot going on at, at a short period of time during the, the end of the Ice Age there. Yeah, that's absolutely true. You know, if you're really observant... And you watch as a Guinness is being poured, and you see the beautiful head rising on that. Most experienced bartenders stop about 75% of the way toward completion of filling that glass and allow that beautiful backward cascade to occur. It's almost sedimentological in the way that it occurs. And as you watch those particles settle, just marveling at a Guinness, as though we could imagine that a geological process in its own right. I want to head over to the bar and do that right now. I hope you guys will join me and we will continue the conversation there. For all you guys at home, we continue the conversation at sevenages.org. You can go and listen to past editions of this podcast, enjoy some of the fine articles there, including Jason's latest offering on the Smithsonian, and much, much more. Of course, we are available on all social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Just go online, search for Seven Ages Research. All right, guys, I think that about wraps it up. Thanks as always for being here. And I hope all of you guys have a wonderful week. We'll see you soon, guys. Yes, indeed. Somewhere in time, on behalf of Jason Pentrail, James Waldo, and yours truly, I am Micah Hanks. It is the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Audio Journal.